You are listening to the Let Me Overthink About It podcast, where I dive into a series of topics that occupy my anxious mind. I'm Sam Adore, overthinker extraordinaire. This week, I'm overthinking about noticing the music with Laura Simpson. Laura is the CEO and co-founder of Side Door. She has been working with and supporting musicians and artists in the music industry for most of her life. Here's our chat. I am here with Laura Simpson. Hey, Laura. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. I love, so I love that I have a YouTube channel now so that people can choose to watch um, the podcast as well as, as listen to it. And I love personally seeing the backgrounds of everybody's <laughs> Zoom yep. calls. I love it. These are all my family and, and friends yes. and some of my, like, I keep some of my badges from where I've been. This is from Make Do Camp. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that's very cool. And I as you can see behind me as well, if anybody's not watching on YouTube, this part is going to be very boring. But <laughs> behind me, behind me, I've got a, a cluster of a lot of photos and memories and stuff, too. I just love to have all that stuff visible and at arm's reach. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Actually, actually, if I pan up, I know this is also but if you look up the oh my we are all stardust is a very um, big reminder all the time. And then the other one is this one is the um, feminine economy wheel, oh. which is if you haven't kind of looked that up, it's a very interesting um, perspective on business. Oh, man, I have not. But that's cool. I'm going to after this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, thank you so much. And Laura, I wanted to overthink with you because I admire what you do so much. Um, I, of course, anybody who's listened to my podcast or knows me well knows I am a huge lover of music. Um, and, you know, when I think about one of the things that gets me through struggles with my mental health and mental wellness, music is number one on my list, you know, between that and writing and, and getting it fresh air. Mm. Um can you maybe, for those folks who aren't aware of what you do, maybe give a snippet of, of your experience with the music industry? So, um, yeah, I got into music just purely as a fan, trying to protect my artist buds from getting the short end of the stick when they were playing live. So I was like kind of a mama bear from the start. And that just transpired into working in a nonprofit called Music Nova Scotia. And I was there for seven years working with artists first like just um helping different like as a membership coordinator but then i was a funding program officer so i had a little more like intimate relationship with people where I, they'd come and have to find money to do the things that they were dreaming of doing mm -hmm. um and all of that experience pushed me into opening um an artist services company um, which I quickly um, had a ton of a demand for, but then also found out I wasn't that like great at it. So I hired somebody to do it um, and just stayed on as an advisor. And then I started Side Door, which is what I'm still at right now. And that's um, basically helping artists find sort of alternative spaces to play, which can be any kind of space that you imagine, like a backyard to a brewery to a barn or whatever um so we do uh, matchmaking for free on the platform so if you have a space and you want people to come and perform in that space you can put it up on side door and you can connect with people um but the, we have the whole like end to end so you can book uh make it like a diy contract with them and then you can also um, make a ticket link and then the payouts and all the legal legalities and all the sort of like organizational steps that you have to do are kind of supported and managed through side door. So you can just be like a fan and you can turn into a presenter of music. So cool. And it's so needed for artists because there's just so many fewer places to play. And a lot of the places to play now are like, you have to pay up front for them. And it's just cash they don't have. Yeah. Oh man. I love that. And I do love too, that it's rooted in, you know, being that mama bear to the performers, because obviously that's at the root of everything that you guys do is putting them first. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, it also takes into account that it's labor and it's cost things for the hosts as well. So you can take yeah. a split of the ticket revenue for 
you know, however much you need and you negotiate all that stuff with the artist and we're there to support those conversations and just take a collaborative approach to making live performances. It's really cool. And, you know, it's interesting because I, you know, I've, I've followed you prior to COVID, of course, but um, knowing and seeing what you guys were able to do, because when you think about what I miss, I think about what I miss the most during COVID. It wasn't, I mean, obviously I miss seeing people and all of, in person and all of those things, but it's like live music, like not being able to just like go to a venue and listen to music, even if it's just for like a half hour, 45 minutes, whatever it is. Um, but you guys were able to kind of help that to happen in a different way. Do you want to maybe give a little bit of background on that? Yeah, it was pretty wild. Um, the university in Waterloo actually just did a case study on this very decision, this like decision point we were at when they shut down everything on, when was it like March 13th, like Friday the 13th, wasn't it? That everything kind of shut yeah, down. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. Around there. Yeah. And so we had booked like many, many shows like and for March. And so I think we, we heard the news and we went back and we canceled all the shows. And then we were like, what? are we gonna do like there was right um we had no idea how long it was gonna be and so we just started hacking together things and within 10 days we had our first online show that we actually did through zoom because our approach was to include the audience who is always part of the performance like we always yeah. do intimate shows um because the audiences are usually a listening audience and they're usually you know really participating in the sense of like how they respond and how they engage. So we wanted to keep that. And you mentioned about looking at the backgrounds when you, you, you know, like we got, so we had the artists performing, but then we'd make a gallery view and people would just like scroll through and see people yes. in their spaces with their pets, doing laundry with their loved ones, having a dance party. Like you suddenly realize that you are not alone, even though you can be with people, you could see people and like, basically enjoy a show together in a way that I had certainly not done before. No. And that really, I mean, we were, people were making sourdough. We were working like very long days, every single seven days a week, like just had way more shows going on um, than we ever have since. Um, yeah. Cause it was just so easy for people to launch a show. And then we had, so we had, artists and audiences from all over the world using the platform. And it was, amazing and it really made a mark for us and now we have that kind of brand awareness and we can kind of go out yeah. and and have that trust because usually dan and i were in the shows too so people met us and yeah so it was That's so cool it was tough but i think we really made the most of it i agree and you said 10 days like within 10 days you had it running? within 10 days we launched a That's show amazing. and it was like the first one we did with christina martin we're just doing like mm -hmm. hey let's do a makeup tutorial so Christina Martin tried to teach me how to do makeup <laughs> and it was so silly. It was ridiculous. And, um, but then the next one we did, like basically the next day was Dan, Dan, Dan. Yeah. Right. And Mike, for people who don't know, Dan Mangan, who's a touring, um, singer song, songwriter, who's, you know, won Junos and stuff like that is Amazing. still touring. And he was the one who did the first, he was the Guinea pig for the first show. <laughs> As he should be. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. He's he's fantastic. He's such a great performer. Um, I sat in on um, an early one as well. It was Jill Barber. I think it was on Mother's Day weekend. Yes. And it was my first Mother's Day without my mother. So my mom passed away on the 17th of March, which is when you said about the world shutting down on the 13th. I have no memory of the right. exact date because I was focused on other things. But um. And it was, I think, especially moving for me just because of the connection that, you know, to Mother's Day and, and my mom, but Jill sang a song for my mom and you were able to put in requests in advance. And when I think about my mental health and what kind of got me through those early days, that memory is top of my list. Oh, yeah, now I cried through that whole show. I think amazing. we had to, I think, I think because our internet was so bad. I mean, I, I spent most of the pandemic in Cape Breton. We had terrible internet. So I was like running a tech company with terrible internet. <laughs> and that show, yeah, I really remember that show too, because the idea was like, 
if you couldn't be with your mom, if your mom was still with us, like that yeah. she could tune in from wherever else she was and you could watch a show together. And yeah, so my mom was on too and all that. And, and I was with my daughter and I think I don't remember if that was at the show or there was another show, but we were had to be watching it outside of the general store who had Wi-Fi. And so we were we were like stealing their Wi-Fi, watching in the car. And Amazing. I don't remember if it was that one, but we had people um remember they had the Zoom bombers? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Is that that show? I can't remember if it was that show or another show. Like I think it was had, a different um, one. Yeah. So so Stephen Page from Bare Naked Ladies, I think it was that one. He he did a show and there was Zoom Bombers. And so we immediately created a fix, a security fix for that before Zoom figured it out. So we had oh, awesome. like a way to secure the the because I, I was mortified when like people were drawing stuff on yes. the screen and stuff. I was like, holy like this has to be fixed immediately. Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. And and that's the thing though. I think we were all just so, and I don't want to use the word desperate, but I'm going to anyway. Like we're so desperate for connection in any way and to be able to feel some kind of normalcy. If you would have asked any of us, you guys, even in the industry, like if that would be successful doing a Zoom concert or whatever, you would say not a chance in hell. Not a chance. Yeah, not a chance. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of experimentation like just and yeah. we and you know now you can now you can use zoom and they have actual music settings because of that whole thing like they there was right. so not, so much adapt, adaptation and the thing was dan was in vancouver and i was in halifax so we had been using zoom for since we had started the company right so we were really familiar with how to like kind of hack it together to make it work that's so um, awesome but yeah no it's it really like it was really an anything goes time and just we were really we were never going to stop. We were never going to shut down like our ambition was too big at that point and still is. But like there was no option to just stop. So we were really yeah. motivated to keep going. Because what do artists do? Like you think the biggest, the and I don't know the stats, obviously, I'm just pulling this out of my ass. But like the people who suffered the most in terms of financial return and all of those things are I would assume would be artists or performers who aren't able to go to a venue and play right yeah. so um what else do you do especially when you don't have an end date yeah exactly yeah no it was really tough and I mean the the other thing is that it made it caused a lot of venues to shut down so mm -hmm. you know we lost a lot of spaces and and so that sort of need for new spaces became even more acute and yeah the need for revenue streams became even more acute and all of that so like and people were setting it up so that they could take donations or sell merch or whatever through the shows and so yeah it was a lifeline yeah and I think too, like, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Uh, well, I went to see Alison Russell. I know you were there too. Um, oh, and Asen, listen, Asenabi, I didn't hear of Asenabi before that show. And yeah. he, as soon as he opened his mouth, completely blew my mind. Yeah. Like he was incredible. And he opened for Alison Russell in Halifax at the Lighthouse Art Center. And she is just a ball of energy. And, she, but, I went to two shows. So I went to that show and I went to Hoxley Workman last week in um, Truro at the Marigold Center. Nice. And my friend Sarah and I, we both went to both shows and we were both commenting on how genuinely grateful they those artists were on stage. Like Allison mentioned so many times, just thank you so much for being here. And when Hoxley Workman, who's been playing for, I don't even know, 25 years in the industry, yeah. just had this genuine gratitude about both of them. Not to say that I haven't seen that before, but it just really stood out these both of these two shows. Do you think that that performers, musicians gratitude has shifted because of what they went through during the pandemic? Um, you know, it's interesting, like I actually see a couple of sides to that, which is some figured out how mm. brutal touring had been um, physically, financially, mentally. Yeah and have really limited the ways that they do live performance after that. Like they okay. either, some people stop touring altogether and they found different revenue streams. Some people are only touring specific kinds of spaces. Mm -hmm. um, other folks are just like 
reducing the amount of time that they do it. And other folks are just like, I really, really need to be in with people. Like I gather my energy from being yeah. around with people doing a live show, which is sort of me. Like I, anytime I feel like I spend too much time behind the computer here, I just go to a show. Like I, that's my, yes. food. so yeah. I, I think it's, it's sort of like, it depended on the personality of the person and the experience. And the other thing is like, think about all the artists that started, especially on TikTok, yeah. that never performed, like gained an audience, but then never performed live and then had to kind oh, of man. figure that out, what that yeah. looked like. And so some people were like getting big opportunities coming out of the pandemic and they had never been in that situation before. So they were kind of like, okay, I got to figure th this out, you know? So it really oh, man, yeah. depended on a lot of things. For sure. It's just really nice to see. And I never considered that, by the way, about TikTok. Like, just I can't even imagine how much of a shift that would be from, like, performing to my phone and then <laughs> performing to a live and audience. using your body. Like, sometimes, yeah. like, people were just, like, sitting in a chair, like, playing their guitar and stuff. But, you know, like, if they weren't doing TikTok dances, suddenly they were like, oh, my God, people can see my lower half. <laughs> and I have to, like right figure out how to do banter. I was just going to say that banter, like, because you, you would just post a video and then that would be it. You wouldn't have the banter in between, but banter is like, for me, banter is like 40% of the show. Yeah. Well, that's why I love that Alison Russell show so much is because yes. everything she said, I wanted to put into a bottle and like, give it to the world. I'm like, this is why, this is why live music matters. 100%. Yeah. She was so engaging that way. And mm -hmm. Hoxley Workman too was friggin' hilarious. I've seen him a few times before over the years, but like, you know, you don't get to see that side of an artist when you're just listening to an album or whatever. So to be exactly. able to experience that is just something completely different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So cool. And so you guys obviously aren't doing that anymore. You're not doing Zoom shows anymore. No, we saw the writing on the wall. I think it was the beginning of 2021. We started to wind down because we could see the dip in attendance and the dip in people creating shows. And um, that just meant there we had to recognize especially from artists that they didn't want to be doing this anymore and if mm -hmm. they didn't want to be doing it the audiences weren't gonna show up for nothing you know so there i right. know some people who could, did continue to do um online and some people just do it like through twitch or facebook live or whatever and they still take donations and they have an audience that wants to do that but it you know, there was a time in the middle of the pandemic that people were like this is going to be forever and this is so good <laughs> I mean, the, the main thing, and I, maybe you noticed this at the shows, but like there were so many more kids. There were so many more people mm. who were of a different demographic, whether they were older or they were rural or they were they had sensory issues or they whatever, like all these people who have found live music in like the traditional, you know, drinking situation, like people who are trying to stay sober, like all these people now had access yeah. to live music. And that was a huge thing to open up. Yeah. To. Like I got so many messages from audience members, like this one fundraiser that was for um, a school of special needs kids. All of the kids could be in their home, their safe space and be dancing and enjoying themselves in a way that they couldn't at a venue that they usually, they usually do that show at Massey oh. Hall in Toronto. So, right. you know, that that's the thing I'm, sad about losing is that accessibility piece 100 percent. well it's interesting you say that because uh, similarly to an event that i've done here um with the local canadian mental health association called women and wellness during the pandemic we moved it online and in person prior to that we'd have like six to seven hundred women that would gather at you know the junior the high school and whatever um and during the pandemic, we had more people joining, we had and we had so much feedback and comments about, of course, it's a mental health event. And people saying, I have so much anxiety at the thought of going to an event with 600 people, right. like I would never go. And so they got to experience the event in a different way, too. So we did lose a little bit of that by going back to in person after the fact. I mean, it's why I continue to push for smaller shows because mm -hmm. I think there is a real need for people to feel safer and more comfortable in those environments. And, you know, like we just did a brunch show. So there was like mm. 
no, you know, usually we do a BYOB or whatever, but I usually am, I downplay that a lot. So a brunch show is like, just like coffee. And like, I reduced the capacity post pandemic in my house because it was just like, you didn't want people to feel too crowded when they yeah. were worried about getting sick. So like in those smaller environments, you can really kind of control that kind of thing and you can choose where you want to have your show. And I think that's really important. Even the safety concerns of just feeling like you have a, a safe space and you know the host of the location and you have yeah. access to speak to them at any time. Like all of that's really important. One thing that I've talked about a lot with my with my own therapist is about having an escape plan. Like, yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm laughing just because it sounds ridiculous. It sounds like I'm literally plotting it out or whatever. But legitimately, if you're in a, if you're going to an event or doing something that you know there's going to be lots of people or you know this and that, like to just be able to know that, you know, I have my own car, I yep. can just go out this way, do this, and then I can go home whenever I choose. And that's so important for people who struggle, for sure. Oh, listen, I, I mean, I have spots in every place that I go to where I sit so that I can feel comfortable. Like at the yeah. seahorse, I sit at the end of the bar where I kind of have my back to the corner. Like that's, yeah. I'm a back to the corner kind of person. Me too. And, you know, <laughs> yes. like I, I may seem really like I'm social all the time and that sort of thing, but I also, I'm like the introvert extrovert combination where I'm like, I know I need to let people come to me and also just like, you know, Know, know where the exits are and like I ghost yeah. all the time because I can't deal with goodbyes which I've been like I'm working on I know that's not nice so like um yeah no I totally totally agree with that and do that myself yeah and like I think I told I'm with you 100% I have to have my back to the corner or like to be able to see the door so that I know who's coming in like it's just it's a lot but <laughs> you do what works you know so you, you can enjoy yourself works. yeah well yeah that's just it how many venues do you guys have? Or do you even know that off the top of your head? Um, yeah, we have more than 3,000 signed up now. And not wow. all of them are active at any one time. It's like we have more than 9,000 artists signed up, but not all of them are touring at any one time. So right. the platform is built on a needs-based system. So like you can't, it's not like a directory. You can't look up and see all venues or all artists at any time. Oh, okay. It's based on where people want to tour and when. So they post a show call and they say like, I'm looking to be in Halifax or Truro and from these dates. And then all the hosts that are in that radius get a notification and then they can put up their hand and say, okay, yeah, I'll host you here. And then vice versa, if a host wants to say like, I'm trying to fill this Monday night at my brewery. And that mm. goes to all the artists in the area. So you really can just use it on need spaces oh that's cool i love that i've only ever used it like honestly through social media i'll see somebody shares an event that's going and i'm like oh i'll go that yeah yeah <laughs> it just happened the other day actually because you mentioned a barn um the round barn in old barns is yeah. one of my favorite venues it's in our true. region it's such a cool spot and i love laura and Bo. yeah um and they have a new show, of course, this will have already aired, but, or it'll already have happened when this airs, but um, they'll, they have a show coming up this weekend and I'm excited for. Yeah, no, they they have a beautiful spot and yeah, they were one of our first host signups. Oh, no way. Oh, that's yeah. cool. I yeah. didn't know that. That's super cool. So you guys have a very creative house, like you're I mean, I know you're kind of like the, the, you're not playing the music, but you still are a very creative person. And your husband is a, a film director as well. Yeah. How has that kind of trickled out into your kiddos? This is totally off, off topic, but I'm just curious. Oh, you know, like, so we've been hosting house shows at our house since they were babies. And so yep. first of all, they can sleep through anything. <laughs> Awesome. Good. <laughs> um, which is great. And my daughter is actually coming to run the door at a show with me in Dartmouth tonight when oh, that was awesome. coming. Um, so they are very like aware and immersed in our like creative lives. Yeah. And then uh Charlie especially is a like a really amazing piano player. He's a really amazing no musician. Way produces as well but i think especially during that pandemic that was his like that's was his escape and his focus is he really got great at music yeah. and producing and then my daughter too i mean she's played but she got into more like theater and dance mm. and that sort of thing so they're both very artistic and you know we encourage it at any 
in any way, shape, or form. And actually, Charlie's yeah. coming with me to the East Coast Music Awards in May. And awesome. um, yeah, so we we encourage it, and also like they they can see and understand the challenges of the industry and of doing that professionally. But I mean, I'm mostly just. I love watching either one of them just sit down and enjoy music or play music or, you know, somehow experience art like Cassie, like just gets into characters and watches full series of like pretty complex series on, on shows and stuff like yeah. that in books. But like that is their way of processing and, and experiencing emotions and like really trying to understand what they're feeling and thinking about and like kind of express sometimes it's just like a nonverbal like I just need to play this out for an hour yes. or whatever and it's such a good like in terms of mental health like oh and man it's, I'm so happy that they understand that is the role of art yes and I don't think enough people understand that so knowing that that and maybe it does it's not true for everyone either obviously but yeah. I think you know that they're they've learned and really just been immersed in that their whole lives so that it's part of who they are which is great yeah yeah I think like I have a theory that everybody's kind of born an artist or a creator and it's sort of like beaten out of us <laughs> like we just Fair. are discouraged or like diverted or we don't think we're good enough so we don't pursue it yeah but that's not that's a thing that is innate in us like we're born to create right so mm -hmm. i think the more that people can retain that or recover that the more they can just channel energy that just gets pent up and really like you know even if you're even if you're like drawing and nobody's going to see it or you're singing in the shower or whatever, it's like the noticing of what that does to help to move through what you're feeling is a really powerful thing that I hope that everybody can keep in touch with, you know? Agreed. I think it's easy to forget that, like you said, because we've sort of been conditioned away from it, but yeah, anytime. Um, and I've talked about this many times on my podcast before about my kitchen dance parties, but it's yes. like, regardless of like, whether you, yeah, it's a conscious thing or, you know, or anybody's actually seeing the art, um, right. it's, it's still helping for sure. Right. Exactly. How cool was it to have the Junos in Halifax? Oh, it was so amazing. Like all these, all these artists and industry folks who I usually have to fly to go see, they were yeah. all suddenly here and I was like, Hey, like, <laughs> let's go down to the waterfront or like I, we, we hosted a co like I have, I work in a co work space. And so we just hosted a lounge, like a dry space for people to come and hang out. And we had tons of snacks and awesome. it was very casual. And it was just so ho heartwarming to host. Um, yes. And then see like, a, a huge range of artists and talent in the city for those days because it started on Thursday went right through to Sunday yeah. it wasn't just the awards show it was cool and you know it's funny because I really am definitely a biased but also I haven't I don't think I've watched the Juno's awards show in a long time but mm -hmm. I feel like it would be hard to top that performance. Like, I feel like that has to have been one of the best Juno performances. It was amazing. Like, it was Nelly so Furtado good. It was on point. And they, so they had, I think it was 32 Indigenous nominees this year, yes. which was a huge record breaking, you know, amount. And yeah. so Ace and Abby, who you mentioned earlier, who played my living room in November, because we've formed a relationship over the years. Listen, I have the hugest crush on him. I just I mean, have to he, point put that out there. Yeah. And he won two awards and it was so amazing. Yes. And uh, like th that, so that component and really bringing in, um, you know, Mi'kmaq history. And then they had a huge component of introducing the rest of the country to the long black history here, like how people have been here for so long. People just didn't yep. understand that we have the oldest black community in Nova Scotia. And I think that kind of sharing of our culture, like beyond the Celtic impression that people have of Nova Scotia and having that play out on the big stage was incredible. Like that, that was the, that was the thing that really touched me the most is that this is our, this is our, you know, broadcast to the world of what we're about and how yeah. special this place is for music. The one thing that I miss is we didn't have any Acadian representation. So I gotta say that. Oh, okay. Like I did, yes. 
wish there was some because I know lots of great Acadian artists and French speaking, specifically Acadian French speaking artists who I wish got a little bit more space. But right. You, sometimes it's hard to I mean, you realize like and then I could go into like, oh, there's like I know Punjabi artists who are here or I know, right. you know, like you can't really where does it end? One, but like. <laughs> Yeah. It was represented on the on the other stages during the Junos, like the Juno week. Yeah, it's just really cool. And I just had I had a lot of pride. I, obviously, I'm not in Halifax, but I had a lot of pride just knowing that um, all of the shows and I did go to a couple of shows, but like knowing how how well produced it was. And I actually I want to do a little shout out because I love Andre Gracie. She would yeah. have been the the force behind a lot of that. She did a, an incredible job. Oh man, she, so we had, I think I was on the host committee and I think we had 12. Of course you were. You, well, where did you find the I was, time? So yeah, well, <laughs> there was 12 subcommittees and oh Andre God. helped to basically execute all of their initiatives, including mine, which was, I had a mentorship program that went mm. on. We had school visits and we did oh, cool. safer spaces training for all the, the, all the venues that were participating in the Junos. Um, and that was just me. And then she had 11 other people to support. Like, she's just, she's a machine. This is John Gracie's partner. John's a musician. And yeah. anyway, and her daughter is actually a really wonderful actress. And yeah, yeah I so. think singer too. She, I think yes. she has an album as well. That's Samantha right. Gracie. Yeah. yeah. Just a talented family, but man, I, every time, like every event that comes to Halifax, I'm like, definitely Andre's involved in that. And sure enough. <laughs> there she was yeah yeah oh that's so cool and you said you're going to the ecmas as well yes i'm going to the ecmas in charlottetown mm -hmm. um yeah i'm going to be hopping around a little bit i'll be in new orleans for the national independent venue association conference nice and then i'll be in toronto for north by northeast as well yeah. as the international indigenous music summit Love it. You're just like trailblazing. I love it. How much of what you do is, do you think just advocacy for, for musicians, performers? It's funny. Like we don't, we don't really need more artists on the platform, like business wise. Like it's, I don't need to attract more artists for the the platform to work. And if anything, I need to find more spaces. So if you have a right. space, please sign up. Oh, I wish. Um, it's always free. And you can always you can always use it f completely for free and make money off of it. So that's my little pitch for hosts. But the thing about with artists is that, yeah, like I've never lost that mama bear thing where I I take it I take it as a huge privilege that artists have welcomed me into their very special circle of trust that I they can share things with me. And my job is to identify, amplify, promote, support, like that. Everything I can do to help people make more sense of that world, the more I can relieve some of the stress of their world, you know? Mm. So I think that's a big thing of just showing up and listening and just trying to participate in a supportive way. It just makes everything, greases the wheels for them a little bit. It's so cool because when you think about the creative person, the artist, the musician, whatever, um, like, I guess it's similar to being an entrepreneur, right? It's like you're trying to yeah. juggle all of the things and, yes. you know, some things are going to fall to the wayside. So I'm sure that knowing that there's folks like you and Dan out there, I mean, obviously he's performing as well, but out there doing some of that work, I'm sure is just such a huge relief. Yeah, I mean, we just had a big conversation about funding because um, the Canadian government just re-upped the Canadian Music Fund and added more funds to it, mm. which sounds great. But then there was this like underlying tone of like, hey, but also these things are a bit broken and we'd like to have a conversation about it. And artists were afraid to talk about that because they didn't want to seem ungrateful. But right. I was trying to, you know, steer the conversation in the direction of like, hey, we have a great opportunity. We have new money and maybe we can innovate the way things work a little bit. And so it wasn't yeah. meant as an attack to, I mean, I literally was a funding program officer. I was doing that job and I, yeah. it wasn't meant as an attack 
on anybody who's providing or, or benefiting from that fund. But it's also about saying, like, how do we center the artist about what this is really for? How do we make sure that yeah. we're doing that in a modern way that's actually providing results for them, you know? So that that was good because then I was getting, because people would write me and they just were afraid to speak out. And I don't have any stake. I don't get funding from those funds. Yeah. You know, like I can, I can sort of act as a support for them without, you know, them feeling like they're going to blow up their career by saying something. Exactly. And that's that comfort. That's amazing that you guys offer that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Listen, I always ask this question to my guests and you already kind of mentioned one earlier in the, uh, in the chat um quotes i'm a quotaholic so i always like to ask if people have quotes that they kind of go to if they they're looking for like support or pick me up man um you know the we are all stardust thing up there is is for me pretty central i don't even know where it came from before i mean obviously it's a scientific fact but um the thing about it that resonates for me is like, especially after the eclipse we just experienced, we are yes. all just small, very small organisms in a very large universe. And we have sometimes this sense of like how big or important or precious or whatever things are. And we can get really anxious or depressed or whatever. But I think for me, anyway, I feel a, a great deal of relief thinking about the bigger picture and mm -hmm. like just taking myself outside of this day to day, whatever grind and thinking about that bigger picture and how precious, how, how lovely and, and, and absolutely precious our life is like, and how short it is in this scheme of things. And like, what are you going to do with this day? Like, how are you going to react to that thing? Or like, who are you going to be with or like what are you going to do for work like all of that becomes a lot more focused when you yeah. are very aware of how kind of small and insignificant you are in the, in the scheme of things you know Listen. you just don't take it as seriously you know and especially to i think a lot of us myself included can get caught up in like the world revolves around me sometimes thinking like i know that might sound egotistical but just like everything's just such this huge deal and everything revolves around, you know, how's somebody going to react to this or that, what that I did. And it's like, you are just like, it's not even that significant to anybody other than you most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. It, it makes you, if you start to kind of relieve that feeling a little bit, it makes you a little more daring to go out and just mm -hmm. try things and, and yeah. experiment and say things. And, you know, like you always want to come from a place of love, but you don't want to miss an opportunity to even just be like, like I met Alison Russell after that show. Oh, and I hate you right now. <laughs> she was at, listen, <laughs> she, she, I'm su still such a huge music fan. And I, she kept walking by me throughout the week and I would just be like, I'm dead. You know, just like, I can't, she's so amazing. And yes. so I saw her at a party. I was like, I kept saying, I was like, I'm going to go up to her. I'm going to go up to her. And then finally I went up to her and I was just like, I just want to tell you, I love you so much. And she just said, I love you too. <laughs> she, and then we had this huge conversation I love um, it. about like because I, I talked about what she said and I was like that was really important for me and you know anyway I think it's it it gives me license to really do that kind of thing and not be scared I mean yeah. I was scared of the first part but <laughs> eventually but why right but why? like she's literally another human being she's yeah. just another human you know <laughs> anyway so I think yeah that's a long answer for the quote. Sorry. Oh, I love it. And actually, well, and I love it just because it reminds me of one of my favorite Joni Mitchell songs. So I I can't remember the name of the song, but she does say, we are stardust, we are golden. Yeah, the one, um, um, well, the carousel going round and round. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Seasons. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we'll put it in the show notes when we figure it out. Oh, yeah, put it in the show notes. What a great song. It's such a good song. I love Joni Mitchell all day long. Um, yeah, ter uh, Tara Spencer sang that song at the recent Music Did Declares she? concert. Yeah, she was phenomenal. <laughs> She's one of my faves. Like, I saw her for the first time with Ben Kaplan 
Uh, and I hadn't heard of her before, but then I've since seen her on her own because she is pretty amazing. She is amazing. Yeah. And a great human just generally. Yeah, She seems yeah. To, and pretty funny too. I follow her on Instagram. Funny. Yeah. Well, listen, Laura, thank you so much for chatting with me. This has been a really great chat. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's always great to catch up with you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks again to Laura for overthinking with me about all things music. I could have carried on that conversation for a very long time. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And thanks once again to the Mental Health Foundation of Nova Scotia for supporting this podcast. 